seat. We'll get started in a little bit here. Um, there are some extra chairs in the back, so if you don't have a seat, yeah, coming. So welcome everyone. Um, I'm Sophie Bicey. I'm a student employee for the CSB Sustainability Office, and we just wanted to thank you all for joining us for tonight's event, Climate Justice for the Beloved Community. Tonight's event is hosted by the CSB Sustainability Office, the Eugene McCarthy Center for Public Policy and Civic Engagement, and Intercultural and International Student Services. This is just one of the many events across campuses during CSB SJU's 2019 MLK Week, with the theme, The Accessibility of MLK's Dream, The Forgotten Ones. Tonight's event will start with a presentation to ground us in a shared understanding of climate justice and its intersections with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s work and dream. We will then have a panel discussion when your questions for our panelists will be welcome. Concluding the event, we'll have an opportunity for mingling and reflection with climate friendly, friendly hors d'oeuvres and organizations providing further information. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce tonight's presenter, Dr. Corey Gross. Corey is Assistant Professor of Environmental Studies at CSVSJU where she teaches courses titled Energy and Society, Gender and Environment, and Social Responses to Climate Change. She specializes in the intersection of energy extraction, climate justice, and grassroots organizing. Her research examines how communities work together to resist fossil fuels. Corey is beginning a new project to investigate, investigate how Native and non-Native organizations collaborate to resist the Line 3 pipeline proposed for Minnesota. In her free time, she enjoys cooking and running with her two energetic dogs. So let's welcome Corey. Thank you very much, Sophie, for that kind introduction. I just want to uh, have us all thank the organizers of this event, which were uh, Alyssa Brown and Quinlan Marshall from CSB Sustainability and the McCarthy Center. So let's give them a round of applause. Unfortunately, neither of them can be here tonight, so that's why I wanted to take pictures to show them that their event was, was a big success. Uh, so I'm, I'm really happy to be here, and thank you all for attending. This is fantastic. Thank you to all of our student panelists who are here to share what they know about climate justice. Uh, they have really great experiences to share with you, so uh, we're set up for a really fun hour. I want to begin the presentation here today by just um, sharing a little bit about what environmental justice is, and then a little bit of uh, what the latest science is on climate change and then what climate justice means to kind of set the stage for, for the comments moving forward. And I want to begin the, the uh, discussion or presentation on environmental justice uh, with some words from Dr. Robert Bullard, who is considered to be kind of the, the grandfather of environmental justice, both of the movement and of environmental justice as an area of academic study. So I have a short clip from him. Uh, and then I'll continue on. Well, the environmental justice movement is, uh, as a movement, is relatively new. Uh, although there were lots of isolated struggles uh, that occurred uh, in this country, um, prior to 1982, for example. Uh, that's usually the date that's given for the birth of the movement in Warren County, North Carolina. Um, there were lots of uh, struggles around pesticides and farm workers, around uh, communities that are struggling uh, against highways being built through their communities and with uh, petrochemical plants, etc. But it was not until Warren County, where that PCB landfill, that toxic waste uh, landfill, was placed in the middle of this uh, predominantly black uh, county uh, and residents in that community said no and we started to get people from all over the country uh, led by uh, Reverend Ben Chavis who at the time was the uh, executive director of the Commission for Racial Justice at the United Church of Christ that began to galvanize people and attracted lots of folks to Warren County and to protest that landfill and to talk about this whole idea of environmental injustice and environmental racism. And once we started to see people actually going to jail, over 500 people went to jail over the siting of that landfill. So it became not just an environmental issue, it became a civil rights issue 
and the human rights issue. And that's, that's when you start to get uh, people from all over the country, uh, African Americans and Latinos and Native Americans, Asian Pacific Islanders, to start to think about this whole idea of uh, everybody has a right to live in an, in an environment that is free from pollution. And no community should be should become the dumping grounds. And so I think that's, you know, that particular moment in history uh, in 1982, uh, where this shock heard around the world of environmental racism and uh, this black community being dumped on, being targeted, and people saying, no, uh, we have a right to uh, live in a clean and healthy environment. That's when the whole idea of environmental justice as a national movement uh, came into effect. So um, as, as Dr. Bullard said, environmental justice is really about ensuring that everyone has the right to a healthy environment. So another definition I can offer you, it comes from our own Environmental Protection Agency. And they say that environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. And I have meaningful bolded here because that's really important. It's not enough to just say, we're going to invite you to the table or we're going to include you in decisions about environmental policy uh, if those meetings conflict with some important cultural or social you know, um, ceremony or something of that particular community. Or it's not enough to give them information uh, about environmental policy that's not in their language. Uh, and these are, you know, these, these are things that occur. So it's really important to have meaningful involvement of the communities who are most affected by environmental hazards to make really good environmental policy. So as uh, Dr. Bullard mentioned, the environmental justice movement kind of uh, got its start uh, with this, this report called Toxic Waste and Race in the United States. And the report found that race was the most significant predictor of where toxic facilities are located. So African Americans and Latinos uh, were, were much more likely to live next to a, a toxic dump um, or a facility of that kind. And uh, so this was really important for beginning the movement. This term environmental racism uh, became something that we started discussing. Uh, the, the three in five black and Hispanic Americans at the time lived next to a toxic facility. But environmental justice is about more than um, just you know, toxins or chemicals. It also includes things like mining, so where are we extracting coal? Where are we extracting energy, uh, oil and natural gas? These sorts of things also are included in environmental justice. And they tend to be uh, extracted or piped through communities of color or, or poor communities because they are thought to have less power uh, politically or economically to fight against these things. Uh, so the, the example that Dr. Bullard talked about was Warren County in, in North Carolina. And in this case, there was uh, this, they, the state was trying to figure out how to clean up all this contaminated soil. And they picked the, the, the county with the highest proportion of African Americans and the highest proportion of people living in poverty to put that toxic waste dump. So that's why people started protesting. Another key piece of environmental justice is that it kind of redefined how we think about the environment. So previously, uh, a lot of people thought about the environment as this wilderness, this place to escape to. So you might think of like John Muir or explorers who create national parks and things like that. But the environmental justice movement said, no, environment is uh, actually, this, this building, this room that we're in is also an environment and it needs to be healthy. The environment is where we live, work, and play. And everyone should have a safe environment. So that's, that's where environmental justice, kind of the basics of that. Uh, and now we face this new looming crisis of climate change, which is kind of this overarching environmental issue where many of the same things apply. So uh, just uh, briefly to tell you a little about the latest climate science, the last hottest 10 years on record have all been since 1998, with most of those since the, since the new millennia, so you know, since you've been alive. Uh, the last three hottest years were also just the last three years, 2015, 2016, 2017. 2017 falls into third place because it was not an El Nino year, which tends to make, can make for warmer years. Uh, so we're seeing 
look, we are observing really warm temperatures. If we look on the longer time scale since the Industrial Revolution, we've actually already observed 1.6 degrees increase, uh, that's Fahrenheit, in global average temperature. So it's called climate change um, because there are different things happening. It, there are places where it can actually be colder. There's variation throughout the globe. But globally, with global warming, we're experiencing global average temperature rise. That's the global trend that you see here on this chart. So um, you know, there are things, there are anomalies and different things occurring, but the trend is definitely upwards. And this actually matches perfectly to uh, the, the trajectory of our carbon emissions. And for some reason, um, this didn't transfer well <laughs> from the, uh, the map. But you can kind of get the idea, if this is oriented correctly, uh, it dovetails, this general kind of increase. And so these are, this is a graph of our emissions of carbon dioxide uh, since the 50s, or the late, you know, 1960. And it does the same thing as this previous one, it goes up. And so we know that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, the structure of the molecules help absorb heat in our atmosphere. And that's, that's what's causing this. And we know uh, that the primary contributor of carbon dioxide is us. Um, our practices for land use, our transportation systems, our use of fossil fuels, all of these things. So uh, the latest, uh, last fall in October, scientists from all over the world, they got together to create a kind of a synthesis report to look at all the best, all the latest science on climate change. And they wanted to see in particular, how can we keep global average temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius? This is the, the target that the United Nations has agreed upon. They've said, we don't want to go beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius global temperature rise. And the scientists came to this quite frightening conclusion uh, that we really need to get our act together. So we, we need to reduce emissions by 45% by 2030. We've got 11 years. So how old are you going to be in 11 years? Maybe you're going to be 30, maybe somewhere around there. So a lot, a lot needs to happen in that time frame. Um, but not everyone is equally responsible for climate change. So this gets back to the justice piece. So it's actually the richest people on the planet that are most responsible for causing this situation. They produce the majority of the world's um, the em emissions. Uh, so half of, half of the emissions from the top 10% of people, whereas the bottom uh, poorest 50% generate a very small fraction of that. And it's not just individuals either. There's a, a, a report that just came out that shows actually 90 corporations are responsible for two thirds of emissions since the Industrial Revolution. So it's really these companies um, and, the, and the very privileged wealthy people on the planet that are responsible for this. Uh, but it's actually the poorest, most vulnerable communities that are most affected. So when, when super typhoons strike in the Philippines, it's the poorest people living on marginal land um, that don't have access to credit, that really, how are they gonna rebuild after their homes are destroyed? Those are the people who are really experiencing the effects. So to give you kind of a, a more concise idea then, climate justice really means that climate change is a social justice issue. And that's because the causes, consequences, and solutions of climate change are all fundamentally social. So it's about emitting uh, greenhouse gases, you know, through our, the way our societies are organized, the way our economies are organized. This is not done equally. Some people are more responsible than others. The consequences, the poorest feel the effects first and worst. Uh, but the solutions are also fundamentally social. So we have the science, we need to act on the science. What are we gonna do about it? How are we gonna change our politics? How are we gonna change the way we live? That's what we need to think about. And when we're thinking about all these things, we realize that climate change is really climate crisis, which I think is pretty clear with this 11 year time frame. There's a real urgency to making these changes. The good news is people are doing things all over the world. So uh, there is something called the climate justice movement, which is a social movement of people trying to uh, create a livable future, trying to ensure that we have that. So they organize at the United Nations conferences. Uh, they demand system change. So really, you know, getting to the root causes of these problems. They organize locally on the ground. These are events that I took part in in California. And then uh, just this last December at the United Nations climate negotiations, many of our panelists were uh, at these negotiations and witnessed this protest. And these were all young people uh, from Poland who were striking out of school 
and raising awareness about this issue of 12 years. Now it's 11 years. Um, but they're part of a broader movement of thousands of students who have been uh, striking school uh, because what, what use is in education if you, if you don't have a livable planet? You know, if you, if you have a dystopian future to go into. So, so students are really taking the reins and trying to raise awareness about this. They were all inspired by 15-year-old Greta Thunberg from Sweden, who has been on the steps of her parliament every Friday for like the last five months or so, uh, raising awareness. And she inspired all these other folks. And then finally, we have a lawsuit here in the United States of 21 young people. Uh, the lawsuit is called Juliana versus the United States. And they are suing the federal government uh, who they say, because of not acting on climate change, is jeopardizing their right to life, liberty, and property, which are our rights as you know, residents and citizens of this place. Uh, so very hopeful things happening. This is moving forward right now, this lawsuit, so keep your eye on it. I'll just close with a, a very, some very wise words from Dr. King, one of my favorite things that he said, and this ties to this book that many of us perhaps read this fall. But Dr. King said, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and cu computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. So it's really about uh, connecting as people, uh, really focusing on values, and reorienting everything we do to be people-oriented, person-oriented. Um, and so with that, I, I think I would love to turn it over to the panelists. We'll hear all of their views on climate justice, and thank you all again for being part of this evening. Thank you, Corey, for introducing our panel and for introducing the topic of tonight. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to introduce our panelists very quickly. We have eight students who have agreed to be on our panel tonight. Um, and before tonight, they all answered the question, what is one impactful word that you associate with climate justice? So after I introduce them, I'm going to share their chosen word. First, we have Madeline Parch. She's a sophomore environmental studies major and a student employee of the environmental studies department. Um, she works as an operations leader for Community Kitchen and a naturalist aide for Outdoor U. Her chosen word is empathy. Valerie Doze is also a sophomore biochemistry major and German minor. She's part of the Honors Programming and Advisor Advisory Council, Biochemistry Club, Benedictine Friends Program, and the Climate Action Club Board. She's also a journalist for the record. And her chosen word is humanity. Melissa Burrell is a junior environmental studies and peace studies major. She is a member of the Peer Resource Program, a career assistant at XBD, and a member of the dance team. Um, she chose a phrase, which is sustainable equity. Abby Ward is a senior political science major and a French minor. She is the president of College Democra Democrats, and her chosen word is liberation. Jake Hauger is a senior biology major, chemistry minor, and a member of the Eco House community. He's involved with climate the Climate Action Club Fossil Fuel Divestment Team, and his chosen word is progress. Hannah Winchettel is a junior environmental studies major. She's a leader of the Climate Action Club and a member of the Peer Research, Peer Research Program and the Ultimate Frisbee Team. She's also a guide for the Voyagers Program and assistant manager at the Mary Commons Info Desk. Her chosen word is personal. Danny Voss is a sophomore nutrition and dietetics major minoring in environmental studies. She's the co-president of Sustainability Alliance, the expeditions coordinator for the Institute of Women's Leadership, and a member of the Jeanette Eco House. Her chosen word is disruption. And Cormac Quinn is a senior environmental studies major with a communications minor. He is the St. John's University Sustainability Fellow and an Eco House resident. His chosen word is cooperation. So I want to thank all the panelists for joining us tonight. Um, and then we have some written questions for you, and then I'll move on to audience questions. So the first question is, what would a world with climate justice look like for you? Um, so there's three microphones you can show them. Can you hear me now? 
Uh, so obviously that's not an easy question because, at least in my opinion, a lot of the problems with climate justice originate from the uh, capitalist paradigm that our world is built upon. It makes sense if you uh, look at things from the capitalist lens that those with less uh, capital, less ability, will be the ones that are the most harshly impacted by the, process, the processes uh, uh, for production. And so as long as we live within this paradigm where uh, people are judged more on their, their, their assets and their capital than they are on their humanity and their rights, it's, it's very hard to imagine a world where that doesn't exist. And that's why it's so difficult, <coughs> at least for me, to envision a world in which climate justice is doesn't need to be fought for, it's already there. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Cormac just mentioned about how um, he doesn't, or it's hard to see and emphasize the human rights aspect of it and how to humanize these people. And I think that that is uh, what is so strong and hopeful about a climate just world. Because if we are stating that it is unjust for some of these people, we are taking away their basic human rights, and that's such a dehumanization that we're saying that uh, how is it up to us to judge that they that other people, literally other human beings, are not at the same level as someone else's? And so, by and I think a, a climate just world would be an area where basic human rights are emphasized. So that could be. Um, equitable access to water, to fresh water, to shelter, to food, to be able to express your opinion. All of these things that we have the inequitable opportunity for privilege and rights and we are able to have this access to, opportun to these opportunities. But so many people, that's just not even a reality. And it, um, it's not fair for us to say that to, we are more human or have more of a right to being human than someone else does. And yeah, a climate just world, I see kind of what Cormac is saying, that it would be it, being able to give a humanization to every single person born. Okay, if I could build off, oh. oh, if I could build off that, I would say also in addition, once like people have uh, rights, uh, being themselves without discrimination based off the color of their skin, their sexuality, their gender. They're then able to have rights for the land and the use of the space that which we have because that's where it's climate justice isn't just about, it's a social issue first and then it builds back to the land and it builds back to those spaces that provide us with the opportunity to be able to be able to live in the uh, living spaces such as this and like be able to build on it and use it um, for our prosperity. So on the flip side then, what is a world without climate justice? Hi. Okay, um, I would say this, what we're living in right now, um, the fact that people don't have equal access to clean water Flint, Michigan is still struggling, um, and look at the type of people that live there. Um, also the fact that pipelines go through tribal lands because they're too unsafe to go through white communities. Um, people not having access to energy in the same way that others do. Um, the fact that small island nations have to have relocation plans because they might go underwater or have to move inward. Um, all of that is unjust and all of that is happening right now. Um, so I'd say we can see pretty clearly what an unjust climate world looks like. I would, okay, cool. <laughs> it's working. Um, I would say also going off of what Abby said, a uh, world, is it not working now? <laughs> So now going off of what Abby said, um, all of the things she said are very, very, very much correct, but also I think a world without cl climate justice would emphasize ignorance. Um, the people who are able to do something about these issues and are able to help the people who are living in these situations 
aren't doing anything about them, and I think that's one of the biggest problems that we're facing in today's society. I'm gonna talk again, sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, I really love that just because, or I appreciate that emphasis on education because I think it, um, that's a, another disparity that we see a lot is that um, if we are educated and especially all of us going to a school like this, we have the power to be able to educate ourselves and know what's going on and that's um, not the case for so many people and there's so much power in education um, and yes, that is all. <laughs> Um, I think, <laughs> sorry. Um, in addition to that, I think one thing that we really are doing right, whether or not you believe in climate change, whether or not you agree with how to go about bettering like a, and bringing out a sustainable future is that we're having this conversation and that people are thinking about these things. So if an unjust climate world is brought out of ignorance, at least that's not what we are right now, or at least we're moving to be out of the ignorance about how to address climate change and what it really means and that it's happening. So I think that's one important thing to know is that we are having the conversation and that's one big step forward. When like we were sent these questions, the first thing that I thought of what about like what does uh, like a world without climate justice look like is um, is asthma rates, which doesn't necessarily seem like something that you would necessarily think about, but when you look at Minneapolis and you look at where the highest rates of asthma are, the highest rates of asthma are in North Minneapolis and the communities with the highest rates of asthma are people of color. And so looking at that, you wonder, you ask why is that? And the reason being is that there's literally a plant in North Minneapolis that's burning fuels and that's putting, uh, that's putting, into, uh, putting stuff into the air and it's causing children to not be able to breathe, to not, and when kids have, are incapable of being able to breathe, they have more greater health issues of future, like later in life. They have, that means that they may not be able to be in school as often, which means that they might not be able to have as great of access to um, uh, various careers because they weren't able to achieve the uh, education level necessary for them to be able to do so. So like we talked about a little bit about Robert Bullard, at the, I believe I said his name right, at the beginning. And like though we talked about like stuff that had happened in the past, he brought aware those awarenesses, but I want I want to make it aware that these things are still happening here, and they're happening here in Minneapolis. And like just by being aware of like simple things like asthma rates, and like and understanding that that's an injustice in <laughs> itself, and that is a climate injustice, I think that's a really important fact to know because once you're able to recognize that, we're able to start to build off of what can we do for those communities? What can we start to change? And what made me really mad was that was a statistic I learned three years ago when I was in high school. And it is a statistic that I looked up last week and it still stands true. So figuring out like how we can continue to become aware and make change, that's the most important thing I think right now, especially in addressing these kind of injustices is to go beyond what it means to be ignorant and to like start working and not just talking about these things as much as I think that that's an important thing to do, but also starting to work towards building on that and building on those conversations and like what can we do? And so like in North Minneapolis, they're working right now to include uh, more like uh, different forms of energy, but like that's still not enough because those statistics of those kids are still the highest in Minnesota. <coughs> Thank you all for those great answers. Um, so the theme of this MLK week is the access accessibility of MLK's dream, the forgotten ones. Who are the forgotten ones when it comes to climate change and how does climate justice seek to improve their lives and future? So I think we've talked a bit about people or the forgotten ones in the US and there's also like I think you mentioned it with the migrants and people from small island nations who are losing their livelihoods. And additionally, when we look at migrants, we also look at what's driven them from their homes. So I think it is important to look at not just the conflict in an area, but also I've done research with the other catalysts leading up to conflict. 
So for instance, in the Syrian civil war, I've looked at what started this war and part of how it began with droughts in the country and then government mismanagement of these droughts, but also recognizing that with climate change, there is more extreme weather events, and this includes droughts and floods, as well as with the higher and lower temperatures than we normally expect. And I think when we look at migrants from this conflict, we don't always recognize why they've had to leave their homes or how this conflict even started. And so looking at the numbers of deaths from the, these wars and looking at also the Somali civil war, um, you start to realize just how big of an impact having droughts can have on a whole country. And even if we haven't experienced extreme droughts in the United States yet, because they've tended to hit other parts of the world first, this will happen eventually. And we need to recognize that just because it's not us who are being harmed right now, and as we talk about with the people who have not contributed to climate change being the most impacted, that's happening right now, but in the future, it could also be us eventually. And so we need to see that migrants, both from areas of conflict and from these small island nations, are part of the forgotten ones, and they're not just leaving for one issue or to move into another country. But we also see the impacts of mass migration into Europe and the United States. So we need to really understand how to help these people and to recognize why they've had to leave and maybe work with other countries who are already experiencing extreme weather events before it breaks out into another large conflict. So I think the theme of Forgotten Ones is very uh, pertinent to this problem because I think as a lot of us know, especially in our generation, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, um, but it also is the same with health, where if your community is too concerned with what's in the air to want to go outside and to socialize with each other, uh, then their community starts to break down. And then as that community starts to break down, they lose their voice. And so now uh, these people that are surrounding these uh, petrochemical plants are too scared to go outside they're too miserable by their own uh, state of decay to, uh, to socialize with others that uh, they do lose part of their humanity and in that respect they're forgotten because they can't keep uh, bringing this to our doorstep because they're too concerned with what's outside. Um, and so it's so easy for them to be forgotten because we've pushed them to the corners and we've shut them up with asthma and we've covered them in soot and, and, and I think that's um, how it relates to this week and why that's such an important thing for us to remember is that these people will only, their, their, their community will only get worse unless there's intervention. That's simply the facts because they do not have the political, monetary, or social ability to make the kinds of changes we need legislat legislatively and um, socially to help them. So it really must be from us because they are forgotten and, and, and we're not. You know, we're on the front page of all sorts of uh, newspapers and websites because we're Johnny's and Betty's. We have a lot of power behind us to make sure that these people aren't forgotten. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just to reiterate that, um, the people that are forgotten are the poorest um, in our world, which often means women, indigenous people, people of color, um, which is where all the intersectionality comes into play. Um, and they're not at the table. So they're not making decisions about how we're addressing climate change. And even there's a fund of money from developed countries to developing countries to help um, with loss and damage and things like that suffered from climate change. and. There was a woman from Peru that I listened to speak um, at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and she talked about how the women in the community don't have access to that fund because they don't really know how it works because they might not have the education or they, again, don't have a seat at the table. And so 
those are the people that are forgotten. And especially as a political science major, I think getting a seat at the table, making a seat at the table, getting rid of the table is how um, to include them and how we can have better um, climate policy moving forward. I also want to not forget that like, there are forgotten ones in quotes uh, on this campus. Like, there are students who are food insecure, and fun fact, that's a climate justice issue. There are, we, li we live in St. Cloud, and like that's a space where you have to have a car to access things. And so that inherently in itself makes uh, students at this campus part of the climate justice issue. So we should be looking at this from a global scale, but I think like for myself, like being here on this panel, it's important to remind us that everything also affects us locally and it affects your friends and it affects your family and that's we should make space for that and we should create space for students to be able to talk about that because it's not something that should be looked down upon it's not something that i think any of us can completely address yeah and that wonderfully leads us into our next question um, so in november in his response to a student letter requesting that the saint john's university make a public statement endorsing climate change findings, President Michael Hemeseth stated that it is important to consider whether, quote, the issue at hand has a direct and significant effect on our students and our educational mission. So through a lens of climate justice, does the evolving climate have a direct and significant effect on our students and educational mission? Okay, um, I think it, this is really interesting that we would have, especially um, the president, president of the St. John's campus question whether environmental climate change is having an effect on the people at our school and with our educational plan. So to start off with, I just wanna emphasize the, what Corey said in the beginning is that what is a, an education without a world, without a planet? What is the point? And especially, um, this is not like a future projected issue. This is happening in 11 years. I'm gonna be, 30 something, <laughs> early 30s, um, when that is, that is so soon. That is a drop in the ocean, and it's not something that can be, we can say like, oh, that's something we'll worry about later. It's a right now issue. Um, and so uh, the fact that we're questioning whether climate change has a direct impact with our education is stating that uh, honestly, the bulk of our school, and uh, um, me included, obviously us with privilege, who are white, who come from middle to upper class, the ones uh, um, who have the privilege of opportunity, we are sticking our heads in the ground and being completely <coughs> ignorant and complacent and living in a bubble where we're saying that climate is not changing. Um, and that's disgusting. <laughs> um, it's the exact same thing when the middle to upper class stated that, or maybe pretended that, uh, um, people of color toward, during the civil rights movement were being treated equitably or pretending that uh, um, there was no disparity between a person of color and us. Or it's the exact same thing as uh, apartheid in South Africa that just ended in the early 1990s saying that we are not affected by those people. And it's the, so that saying that is the exact same thing as saying that uh, the climate changing is not affecting us right now. Um, and so that is blatantly ignoring every single student on this campus or throughout the world who doesn't have a home because of flooding, who doesn't have clean water because of fracking, um, who doesn't have right to health or females don't have right to contraception or information about contraception. Um, and it, it is ignoring the refugees who are here on this campus, who are in my classes, who are in your classes. And so why, I physically don't understand why that would not to, why that would not apply to our educational goals and why that would not apply to our personal lives. So finally, um, I just want to state that uh, the whole point of our school and what we pride ourselves off of is these Benedictine values, and those Benedictine values are being completely and blatantly ignored if we are not saying and not supporting these people who are being affected by climate change and in a climate justice movement. So stewardship and justice and peace and humility and most of all community, which is our favorite word, 
all of that is being ignored if we're staying and stating that um, the, we should question whether climate change has a significant or direct impact on our education. That's, uh, that's one hell of an act to follow. Um, so I did actually write back to President Hemisep about this because I felt very passionate about this, um, especially because it was more of a, uh, he didn't actually have to do anything at all except to say climate change is real. And that kind of burying your head in the sand attitude is something that we're lucky to have here in Minnesota. I mean, we're far enough from many oceans, so we don't have to worry about sea rise, or sea level rise, not by any volcanoes. I mean, we're very lucky to be here but that luck needs to be used for something greater. Um, and we're not all from Minnesota. Uh, I was thinking about my, my, um, my Bahamian friends. You know, they're from an island that is going to suffer these, these consequences. Our, I have someone in my classroom in Vietnam, also on another coast. I mean, when we think about the St. John community, we have an image in our head. And this week, a lot has tried to challenge that image of that uh, generic, Minnesotans, uh, cis, white male, and female, um, we are a diverse community, and therefore, climate change is gonna affect us in a, in a myriad of ways, and the fact that we wouldn't make a, simply, you know, not putting any actions behind it, but just acknowledging the fact of it being a reality is, is disturbing, and I don't have the same passion as her, but I very much support everything she said. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to follow up a little bit on what Melissa said, too, in a less glamorous way. Um, but part of the CSPSU education mission is to give a Benedictine education, and I think our school loves to talk about our Benedictine values until our Benedictine values ask us to do things that might be challenging. Um, and so just to read some Benedictine values from online and some stuff about them, um, I'm not going to read all of them, but community living. Let all things be common to all. Hospitality, to offer warmth, acceptance, and joy in welcoming others. Justice, to work toward a just order in our immediate environment and in our larger society. Moderation, to be content with living simply and finding balance in work, prayer, and leisure. Respect for persons, to respect each person regardless of class, background, or professional skill. Stability, to cultivate rootedness and a shared sense of mission. Stewardship to appreciate and to care lovingly for all the goods of this place. Um, and I guess I would just ask you to think about that and if climate change relates to any of that. And if yes, then it relates directly to our educational mission. I think I, I'm going to ask the next question so we have time for some audience questions. Um, but as we've talked tonight, Climate justice is linked to racial inequality, poverty, politics, health, and human rights. In Dr. King's Memphis address, the day before he was killed, he said, we've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now, because I've been to the mountaintop, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with, with you, but I want you to know tonight that we, as a people, will get to that promised land. So in the face of such interrelated challenges, how do you all stay motivated and hopeful about climate justice? Okay, so um, this kind of seems like a cop-out answer, but I would probably say that my peers and the people who are here tonight usually are the ones who bring me the most hope. And the people who were at the protest on Monday and everyone who is passionate about something that has anything to do with people who are being oppressed in any sort of way are the people who really I look up to and who I look for when I look for role models. and are the people who I think will make a difference in the world. Um, so I guess what gives me hope is, um, I think we need to remember that um, when we're trying to work against the effects of climate change, we also need to remember that we're working towards a just better world in general. So as opposed to envisioning this doom and gloom sort of place, we need to remember that we are working towards a place in which everyone is valued equally and everybody has access to clean water and um, a life, I guess, free of, of oppression. I think also the people across the US and the world who understand the importance of this issue 
And even if you've heard about climate justice for the first time and you're talking to your friends about it or you're coming to these events or to different clubs that focus on it, I think that's really important. And when we were at the United Nations conference in December, there were a lot of people from Europe and Africa, especially that I got to talk to, who understand the importance of climate justice and recognizing that people are left out of discussions and which kinds of people we leave out and what this does to our society to make it completely unequal. And just seeing that there's people in other countries too who understand this is a global issue, even though it affects every single one of us, was really exciting especially when if there's people in the US who don't work towards this, we know that we have allies across the world who also understand and are working to pass these policies and working at the national and international level to also try to make these changes. Uh, Melissa's passion gives me the energy to keep going. <laughs> Uh, but also the fact that everyone here agreed with what she was saying. Um, the fact that the president of St. John's University can say that he's not going to endorse climate change and everyone reacts negatively to that, that gives me hope because I see a lot of you, and you're not environmental studies majors, but you still care. Uh, you're, you know, we have nutrition majors and other people who are taking care of other aspects so that I don't have to. Um, because we're in a time of prosperity and peace. You know, never before in history have we seen such peace across the globe. And all throughout history, you'll see a trend of people helping people. It seems to be a bit of a, a tenant of our humanity. And so there's never going to be an end. There's, justice is a spectrum. So there's never going to be an end to people trying to fight for other people. And that's where I get my hope. So then we do have time for maybe one or two audience questions. Um, so if you just want to raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I just kind of want to ask the panelists, um, as a fellow student, um, could you give advice to other students who are here, um, how they can get involved in this movement um, and what they can do um, on an individual level, but also getting involved um, with the movement here at St. John and St. Ben's? Just talk really loud. Two words, show up. Literally, show up to, you did it here today. You can show up on whenever there's a meeting for a club related to these issues. You can ask professors outside your discipline when there's something to go to, because fun fact, there's a lot going on in the city. You can show up to those, and you can show up for your friends and support them. I know I'm really grateful for all my friends that showed up here today to be like, you got this, because that's, that's what you need. You need to have a collective community showing up for each other, not just for climate issues, but also for, those, uh, for the protests on Monday. If you couldn't show up there, you can at least show solidarity in some way or shape or form through social media. It's such a heavy influencer through sending a thoughtful text to a friend. That's literally one of the best things you could do. Because by showing up for one person, that person's going to show up for others. Yeah, climate change can be a really overwhelming issue. It's hard to think about getting involved when all you hear about like are the negative things that it's affecting and how it's affecting so many things in so many different ways. But I think the easiest thing you can do is just spread the word. Find one thing you're passionate about, if you're super into renewable energy or you're into the social justice side, like learn as much as you can about what you're passionate about and spread that word to other people and tell them why you're passionate and tell them how they can get involved. Even actively thinking and actively talking about this issue is gonna bring more awareness and cause more people to act upon it. So I think that's one huge thing you can do. I also stress the importance of voting. So even though it's not an election year, when there is in the midterms or in 2020, you need to vote for people who represent your interests and the policies that you would want passed in order to help with this issue and other social justice issues. 
And you can also call your senators and representatives, even if it's not an election year, anytime, because they're supposed to be representing you. They're not supposed to be representing the companies that usually influence when these, if these policies are passed or not, especially the um, fossil fuel and energy companies that tend to have a lot of monetary influence over the different climate change and climate justice, justice policies that don't get passed. So you would need to call them and then also vote for who is going to represent your interests and the interests of people, especially those that we talked about who are forgotten. So that's really important. And even though we stress the importance of voting and we had, I think, better turnout in 2018, every single one of you should vote. And if you think your vote doesn't count, then you're lying to yourself. That's wrong because everything does matter. And really researching these issues and looking for candidates that support the policies you want because we want to be educated voters and really looking at who is going to represent your interests. On the political side of things, uh, there's research that shows that if you have like 20 tweets to the same representative about the same thing, it will show up in a report that their aides will get them. And so, I mean, 20 people is not a lot. We have well over 20 in this room. We all tweeted at our representative. They would actually see that in the report that their aides get them. That's a really easy way for your own club all of you guys coming out today and I love your enthusiasm for climate justice and talking about the forgotten ones um, but I can't help but notice that and you guys are talking about the table and like the seat at the table but I can't help but notice that the forgotten ones are not at your table do you guys have anything to say about that or I understand it might not have been in your control at all um, my second question is we keep talking about talking about these things, but if you guys had a vision on the actions that need to be taken, like there's a five-year-old girl, um, like we saw on the slides, she's at, on the steps of her Capitol or Congress or whatever it is every Friday. We're college students, we're grown, we're adults. Why are we not doing things like that? Yeah, I think that's a really great point and I'm really glad that you raised that because it's very clear um, that that is a problem and that's something that the climate movement has been critiqued on for since its beginning, that it's been white, middle class, often women. Um, and I think something to take into consideration is why aren't the forgotten ones here? And as a movement, why, what are we doing that's not including them? And part of that might be that we're not talking about issues that make them want to come to the table. So maybe talking more about like the racism and clean water access for everyone and showing up when the Dakota Access Pipeline stuff is happening, calling Governor Walls about line three. And so I think just rethinking what we're doing to be inclusive is something that we always need to be reevaluating and could help make a more inclusive and actually just climate justice movement. I want to know that the seat, the seat right here where it's open. I don't take claim to this and I don't want to. And I completely, I want there to be more at this table and I know that there are voices that should be up here right now and aren't. 
And I am grateful that I was granted the opportunity to do this, but it's not always my place. And I recognize that. And I want to say thank you so much for asking that question because it's what everybody should be thinking in this room right now. Um, and I also want to say like, though that girl who's on the steps every single day, I thank her for the fact that she's able to do that so I can keep going to my classes. Because right now for myself, I know that the best thing that I can do is get my is to get this education because then I can use it and put it towards a future where she doesn't have to do that. And I reckon that, and I hope that through the voices like through those things that we talked about here today, that it opens the floor for greater discussion and greater action because that's what should be happening and it's what that I strive to do and I know what so many of uh, people in this room do every day. Uh, whether or not it's recognized by the entire school, there are actions being put into place. Uh, thank you so much for asking this question and it's something that I've been dealing with as the St. John's Sustainability Fellow, which is why I intentionally invited or sent an email to all of the, the uh, Black Student Association, the African Student Association, Korean Student to all of those groups because I see that this is a problem. There's reports that statistically prove that this is a privilege to be an environmental studies major. I am privileged to be a white male who can think about the environment instead of thinking about my own economic well-being. And that's part of the reason these forgotten ones are, are too busy uh, trying to survive that they don't get to think about the greater cause. Uh, I like thinking about all of you because I don't have to think about myself. And that's a privilege that I, I understand every day and think about. Um, how lucky I am. As far as why aren't we out there on the front steps of the Capitol, um, we do try alternative means. Uh, Climate Action Club, you know, we meet once a week and we're trying to divest St. Ben's. It's not exactly the same as tenting out in front of the president's house, but it's a more, uh, we're working within the system to try to change things. And so uh, I would love to go protest if you want to come with me, like we can head down to the cities right now. Um, because this is a real problem and I'm privileged enough where I could go protest right now, uh, and many of us are in that same area of, of, of privilege. Um, and so I would love to give my seat up to anyone here, again, just like Danny. Um, it's, it's, you know, yeah, more to say. Just going off Cormac's point quick about protesting, um, a friend of mine went to the Women's March and had a really powerful post on social media. Um, so he was at this march and he put, and you know, you can see everyone marching and then he posts this picture of this woman of color who is in the window of an apartment and that's because she's cleaning and she has to work. And he had a really well articulated message about that that I probably won't do as well. But yeah, thinking about who has the means to protest. And so I think keeping that into account, and that also means like not being silent, because if you have the resources and abilities to do these things, then you especially need to be doing them, because not everyone can. And so I just think that's something that's really good to keep in mind. Hi. Sorry. Oh, my God. We, we actually are over time. Um, because so we are going to have to end the questions, but if you want to ask your question to the panelists afterwards, um, because we have some tablers who are here who would love to tell you more about the, their organizations as well, um, I'm going to have to call the time, and I want to give a big thank you to our panelists and to Corey, um, so we can have a round of applause for them. I want to reiterate what Corey said at the beginning and thank Alyssa Brown and Quinlan Marshall who planned this entire event. Um, so I want to give them a big thanks and unfortunately both are unable to be here. Um, additional thanks go to the 2019 MLK Week Planning Committee, Intercultural and International Student Services, CSB Media Services, and CSB Events and Catering who have graciously provided a delicious special menu for us this evening. Um, so I invite you to join us now to have some more of the food and to talk with our vendors around the room and take a collective reflection of what we've heard tonight. So what of what you've heard, what worries you, what inspires you, and what can you do to further MLK's dream and fight for justice? Please approach the tabling organizations and learn what they've brought to share with us. 
and a big thank you to everyone who's been here and everyone who came to our event. Thank you.